delighted to have you back to this our show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happens to be our 264th show, and you are about to be our 14,266 viewer. Thank you for that. Today, we want to talk about something utterly important, uh, always, but increasingly, which is democracy. And what does democracy have to do with architecture? A lot, actually, it should. However, me and the academia, I was once told you shouldn't talk about politics, but what else can you talk about? Because aren't politics what we agree on as rules and regulations and ethics as a society? We have to talk about it. So if we can get the first slide up, uh, how do we connect architecture to politics, democracy on our island here? The one that reminds me the most of it from experience, having him on, on a review, which is who you see at the very top left, is former Aber uh, uh, Governor Abercrombie, Neil Abercrombie. And he is the one that I associate the most with democracy because he came to the review very prepared with his book that he did his PhD on. And that's Louis Mumford's Wither Honolulu that he brought with him. And um, he got as close to proposing, which was highly controversial, a super tall tower, taller than the 400 feet cap that we have on towers. And in the review, he suggested someone that um, I can see why uh, suggesting as an architect who is Rento Piano, who after all is one of the most diaclimatically concerned and engaged architects, just like his former uh, partner, uh, Norman Foster. Well, that is history. And uh, although we are uh, electing a new governor in the future, uh, Abercrombie is not running, but uh, we will see uh, what happens. And it's important. Let's go to the next stage because politics on a world stage, we're in unprecedented times right now with the Ukraine war and as if we would have known a year before the Ukraine war started with the show quotes at the bottom and the top right, we were addressing that issue with an article that was called um, Poser for Putin. And that was Prick, Wolf Pricks, who we talked about the ethical breach of who do you work for? And uh, more recently, very top left is uh, one of our most uh, engaged and successfully operating architects of these days, uh, another European, fellow European, this is Bjarke Ingels. Do you see standing to uh, the uh, Brazilian uh, president, Bolsonaro, who also hasn't treated democracy um, as much as he should have been. And uh, you hopefully watched that uh, the election was, and shockingly, he still won too many votes. So for the final results, we need to wait until the end of this month and keep the fingers crossed. Because when it, within these leaders, we give the hands of our future, the rainforest, the tropical rainforest of the Amazon has a huge impact and he has been cutting it down like no one else before. So saying that, um, at the very bottom right, by the way, going back to uh, to Pricks and Putin, uh, Pricks has been building this rather pretentious episode, and I thought, um, uh, infotainment center for BMW in Munich. And that's next to one of the modern marvels, not just of architecture, but as a representation of democracy in my home culture and country of Germany, which gets us to the next slide, please. That is what the article at the bottom, which my father gave me uh, from his newspaper in Dresden, Germany. And I don't want you to make you uh, learn German here on your own, so I translated for you. The title is here, Toothpick Over uh, a pantyhose over toothpicks. And this is the Olympics in 72 that we had in Germany, which was overshadowed by the terrible terrorist attack um, of uh, the Israeli athletes. But we didn't let it, or the world didn't let it overshadow because the architecture of that was so powerful 
to um, be remembered as a demonstration of democracy. At the top right, you see uh, from this uh, past month, a 50th anniversary exhibit in the main capital uh, in downtown of Munich, Germany. Uh, top left, you see our guest, Larry Medlin, who we had in many shows, who was a collaborator with the great Fry Otto. And he said Fry is the name that his mother gave to him because it means free. And he wanted him to be free as a post for uh, emerging generations. And Fry Otto was the engineer um, on that project. Uh, next slide. The architect was Gunter Banish. And about that architect and his office and his firm and the legacy and the continuation of that firm we want to talk about. Gunter and the other Gunter, my father Gunter, are both from Saxony. And uh, my father didn't have to go to the uh, military, but Gunter had. And um, <clears throat> there's more than rumor. Um, the story is that he happened to be in a submarine. And the submarine, um, he said, um, impressed him or had an impact on him so much that he said, if I ever get out of that confined, compressed, contained, suffocating space I was trapped in, I will make sure no one will ever be again. And that's why freedom, uh, not just as a living model, but as an architectural agenda, became his mission for his lifetime, which he very successfully um, uh, basically executed. At the very bottom left is a museum he did in the outskirts of Munich at the Starnberger See. And it has something uh, that mostly museums don't have, but any building in Hawaii here should have is lanai. It's very lanai heavy. So next slide. Uh, my first sort of personal interaction was when I was, as my emerging generation now, now working with me, was still in school, and I worked for my professor, and there was a competition, an invited limited competition for the most uh, iconic building in my hometown, which is the State Bank, and you had big names participate, Mario Botta, Swiss architect, Helmut Jahn, who I bless him, recently got run over by two cars. Um, I am uh, reporting from the big island here, which we have the Ironman going on, so everyone drives safe out there to, re to that regard. And, you know, that was the beginning of the, the, the 90s and everything. The computer was new, so we all tried to do the most fancy renderings and try to squeeze that pretty big program into, uh, into everything. And so we all had to come up with towers. Uh, and we all used the computers as to look, make look everything very professional and clean. Not so much one submission that was rather freestyle, hand drawn. The lines didn't meet at the corner of, let's say, you know, a, a, a 90 degree angle, but continued very provocatively. And there was no tower. Uh, I, I X this out here because the only drawing I found online is this one here. So there was no tower. So we all thought, what is that? But we all knew who is that because that was the signature style and continues to be of Ginter Banish and his office or his multiple offices, which he split into shortly after that. So um, it took quite a while um, for the client uh, to decide, and I had the chance to have heard Gunther uh, one and only time in my life, and I will never forget in this amazing uh, talk that he gave to the players in the city. And he did not mention that project in one single word, but he mentioned all the opportunities and also missed opportunities clients with similar projects had um, you know taken advantage of or not and it didn't take long after that when the city and the client uh, public client sort of decided uh, to build it uh, that was uh, Gunther then um, got up in age and wasn't uh, doing so well anymore and uh, passed away not that long after that so I'm very happy I had that amazing experience to having had him uh, you know make its case in a very understated yet very, very powerful way. 
Uh, later on, by the way, a tower reappeared. And I also attended a, and that gets us to the uh, next slide. Uh, I attended a lecture of his structural engineer at school at my, at my alma mater in Hanover, Germany, where he was just saying how hard it was to work with Günther because Günther always said, well, a column can't be, um, uh, you know, thicker than eight centimeters. And he said, um, everyone said, why is that? And he said, well, that's the distance between the eyes of a human being, and we should never clog and block things again because of his agenda of democracy there. Also, he had to add a large glass sculpture to the top of the building at a point when the building was already under construction because Günther was trying to oppose and superior a rather reactionary town hall building that the people had decided to build in the uh, early uh, last century or the last millennium in my hometown. So this slide here is also very important because uh, the office believes um, in inclusivity and they believe that even if the, 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 the typology is very, very uh, enclosed and exclusive, as a bank is, only you have your money, you're allowed to go in there. He fought that and he said, no, it needs to be open to the public. So this is here at the top right, you see Lenny and me having our lunch in our favorite sushi restaurant where you can get uh, all you can eat uh, for still like 15 euros or 15 bucks. Uh, so rather inclusive for people to go there. Uh, at the bottom right and middle, this is a one of our most uh, traditional uh, Sunday evening primetime crime scene TV shows that the building played a major role in at one point. So a very iconic building, um, a very um, uh, powerful building, a very ecologically successful building, and a very public building. And although it's modern architecture that not everyone might buy into, but what the building does, how the building performs, many people can agree that's the right way to go. And next slide. So it rightly so made it into this uh, World Encyclopedia of Architecture here, uh, which uh, our firm had the honor to be next to them. So their bank, high-end, high-tech, and our little kindergarten, first pass the house kindergarten for our hometown in low end and low tech, both on uh, the opposite ends, but of this, on the same side of architecture of the 21st century, which needs to be post fossil. The two gentlemen down there, the one on the left is our dear collaborator, Martin Spade, who was in charge of the uh, structural engineering and the biochromatics. And the guy on the right side is Matthias Schuler, who I once, when I was on another jury, there was a guy sitting in the back and looking rather casual, so we didn't know who he was, looked like a custodian. And that is Matthias Schuler. He's a mechanical engineer and the most progressive mechanical engineer in the world that now all architects want to work at if they want to make a building that is net zero and actually net plus. So um, he works with architects on that and started out with Danish um, as to begin with. And Transolar, as his firm is called, was involved uh, in that in that project. Uh, by that time, um, uh, Stefan Danish, Günther Danish son, uh, early had started after initially not wanting to get into that business uh, and he studied philosophy and then later on changed his mind. Luckily, rightly so, we uh, can tell now, and uh, joined the firm, but ran a separate branch. So next slide. Uh, that branch um, that he ran um, uh, made him projects, do many, many projects, and he was, they did cooperation. So he was involved in the North LB as well. And obviously when his father wasn't doing so well, he was representing the firm when they pulled us as uh, the ones who had gotten the highest award on a state level for our little community grocery store that was the precursor of the kindergarten. And many thought, why would you give that highest award to a box 
where you can wear uh, sell underwear in six packs. And so they pulled us out on a public panel discussion uh, with one lady that we know very well because we've been talking about her quite a lot and she's quite in the spotlight now as the uh, president, commission president of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen. By that time, she was our state minister slash secretary of cultural and family affairs. And uh, she was the one giving the award. So um, talking inclusivity, Stefan at that time already for a while, you know, one of the most busy and arguably here, uh, the most relevant German architect um, here um, uh, basically came and spent an afternoon uh, with our client. And when it was time to go on the panel discussion, he basically said, okay, I spend a time with clients that I could have never worked for. They run $1 stores or one euro stores as to make a living. And, and he said, these guys, these poor guys, this budget of the whole project was what I had for the facade. And he said, that's why I appreciate what you were doing. And we obviously appreciate what Stefan was doing for us. And then um, the rest um, is that um, I went after that to go back to the U.S. and coach. And next slide. And by that time, Stefan had been doing their, not their first, but their most iconic project in the U.S. on the East Coast in Boston. And that's the Gensine building. And this is once again a sort of a short high rise. Um, in a similar climate to the one in Germany, but yet different in detail. Again, applying the same principles of making a livable organism, a building that breathes, a, be, a, breathe, a, a building that has like natural systems as the body has of natural daylight, of heating and cooling, everything being as natural as you can be it, yet architecture being architecture, nature being nature. Next slide. Um, I uh, teamed up with the um, AIS, that's the uh, American uh, Institute or Organization of Architectural Students. And at some point we were thinking who we get as a guest speaker. And we were thinking of Vanish. And so we picked up the phone. Um, I wanted to use my connection to the Hanover uh, Faden Atlas and ask for who the project architect was. And I was told it was another Martin, Martin Haas, who you see on the left. And uh, I was told by Utah. And Utah was, um, as you think of a huge successful architectural office, she's the secretary, there is no such thing. Danish has the utmost horizontal, basic, democratic organization where everyone picks, in the, picks up the phone at some point. So they just don't have that vertical hierarchy. They have a horizontal hierarchy. And she said, well, I, I talked to Martin, and he did. But he said, well, before you really want to get me on board, why don't you come and look at, our most, at my most current project, which was in Hamburg, which is the big city over from Hanover. And they built the Unilever headquarters, which is a big multinational organization, corporate of nature. And once again, he wanted to democratize that. The architectural detail is here, what we have been experimenting with some years ago for that school for mentally disabled children, which you see at the top in the middle, which we did a show about. And he pushed it to the next level and used that as a single layer. Uh, material. If you want to know why, you got to go back and watch the show. Talking, um, um, you know, being a, a good educator, not just to your client, but also to the emerging generation gets us to the next slide. Uh, because Günther Benisch had taught at a school in Germany in Darmstadt. And for that reason, uh, when I went to school, you know, that was the school to go. If you If you really made it, I didn't go there. Uh, you went there. And so I got to know that school years later when I was invited by uh, one of the founding members that Martin is as well, the, the German uh, uh, Sustainability uh, uh, Chamber or Council, the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Nachhaltiges Bauen. 
and Manfred Hegger, uh, one of their presidents who unfortunately passed away too uh, early in his life a few years ago, won something with his emerging generation twice consecutively, which is an American student uh, competition, which is the solar decathlon. You see at the bottom here our school's contribution from some years ago, spearheaded by Professor Rockwood, Dr. P. Rockwood. And at the top, you see uh, the two solar decathlons by the Darmstadt School of Architecture, which again are Danish taught from the mid 60s to the mid 80s. Uh, next slide. We return to uh, our predominant typology here, us being squeezed in between two mountain ranges, high rises. And this is Martin uh, stopping by in the prairie in Lincoln, Nebraska, on my home away from home where I taught, went back to, to teach. And so you see him at the top right with El Quick. Uh, with this fantastic project in downtown about getting orientation right first and foremost. And the project, the other three slides, is the project next to the Unilever building in Hamburg, which is the Marco Polo Tower, which again, you see what it has. It has lanai's all the way around in chilly, cold, and pretty soon in deep problems because of Putin's gas not available. Hamburg, Germany. Next slide. Uh, this is what all the buildings here should have and we think in Chicago should have as we're currently in investigating the two and comparing and alluding to the little show quote at the top right, getting us to the next slide. We've been proposing for quite a while uh, one of the most attractive fenestration uh, products, which is the good old jealousy that's our local thing that the German company who always made it had optimized uh, to triple pane glass. Uh, passive house, uh, absolutely top notch. Uh, so you're not losing any energy. So if you're doing split system AC, you at least a few times you use it, you don't lose it. And then you open them up all the time. Next slide. Jealousies are a Banish legacy. This is a proof of evidence of when I revisited one of his other most iconic projects that have to do a lot with the core of democracy. Uh, and you see the jealousies. And next slide. Uh, that is the project. And that is why we paired it to our capital. This is the capital, the national capital of Germany at that time in Bonn before their unification. And it's basically roof architecture with spaces underneath flowing through. And his agenda was that you as a citizen could, just like you can do in the chambers here, by the way, you can walk by, press your nose at the glass and watch the ones you elected down there because, you know, there are no dictators. They're basically collaborators who you elect to run things. So, so far about roof architecture, but what about some of the horizontal fenestration wrapping wall architecture? Next slide. If you do it here, um, as Soto and I talked many years ago on this show one here, you should do it in always shading yourself. So here's the Kashiambi's King Center. It has a glass facade behind, but it's shaded and wrapped all the way around with this metal uh, uh, mesh. Next slide. That here it is again. And um, again, a prime example of uh, the Takashi Anbi's work. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the Sunset Tower, uh, just on the opposite side of Alamoana Mall on Atkinson Drive. Uh, the, the the Plinth part has the same thing. Next slide. And as we discovered in the show here, uh, it's a theme that um, carries through, and architects mid-century have embraced and have used as to naturally cool buildings by not letting them go overheated, by not letting the sun get to the glass behind. Next slide, just one more example about the ingenuity of different ways and uh, you know different iterations, uh, different variations you can find to achieve that. So next slide, another building in Honolulu, you know, that does it right. And no, it's not in Honolulu yet. But it should be right because it seems like, you know, the light is nicely filtered. There's still daylight coming through. 
but just as much as not to overheat. And how does that make it look from the outside? Because Banish, this is a Banish building. Uh, Banish always does it as to design from inside out uh, versus outside in. How does that then look from the outside? Next slide. Uh, this is it. Uh, it has a similar to Unbi, a metal screen uh, wrapped around it that keeps it cool. Next slide. And that screen is very carefully calibrated. Uh, and next and final slide, uh, zooming in. And what that is and why that is, uh, you will hear next week when we have its creator uh, on the show, who is uh, Matt Noblet, who is Danish uh, partner in his uh, American office of Boston, Massachusetts on the East Coast. So hopefully with his cheerleading about the context of the firm and their utterly important, uh, most democratic approach of uh, planet and people friendliness, um, I leave you with that. So hopefully having gotten you excited about uh, meeting Matt next week on the show. And until then, please, Stay easy breezy, breezy easy. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.